Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 19, Basic. Take it away, Jason. Hey, everyone. So I just got back from Tahoe. Um, for people who don't know, Lake Tahoe is a lake that sits on the border of California and Nevada. And um, is that right? <laughs> I think so, yes. <laughs> I, I, uh, I've done a lot of driving. But, um, but basically, uh, it's pretty fun. They have like a, you know, you can go skiing in winter. In the summer, you can go hiking and uh, rafting and things like that. And so we, uh, we went rafting. We actually saw a black bear that like literally jumped in the water and started coming towards the raft. And uh, we started freaking out, but, um, but uh, he didn't make it all the way to the raft. So he got about like 10 feet away and then he turned around and ran back. But we were L- lucky for all out. the inhabitants of the raft, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we were w- wondering who we should throw feed the bear. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, you don't have to be able to outrun the bear, just the slowest person. Yeah, what exactly. happens if you're in a raft, though? If you're in a raft, you just have to be able to throw one person into uh, the bear. So you, okay. You have to be the most liked, the most disliked person. It's the hugest advantage. Do you have time to take a vote? Yeah, you could pretty much vote someone I, off. I think the raft. it just makes whoever's the strongest, right? Can just throw, <laughs> throw the weakest person off. Maybe but you can maybe be clever about it. Like, hey, get the camera and then push them in or something, you know, when they're not looking. So there's a, there's a, there's an opportunity to be crafty here and save yourself, you know, uh, as in many many dangerous situations in life. Oh man, <laughs> this conversation's yeah. not going anywhere good. <laughs> yeah. So bears and rafting. So, so we saw a bear. Near death experiences. Okay. So so first the bear jumps in the this water. This is why I don't go outside. <laughs> oh yeah. Just stay inside. <laughs> Look at these things on YouTube. Sometimes bears can come inside though. You have to be careful. I lock my front door. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So um, so yeah. So a bear jumps out from the bushes like straight out of duck hunt or something like bear hunt. That, that was a, that was a dog. The dog comes out of the yeah yeah you're dog right dog and the ducks yeah yeah so straight out of bear hunt the duck hunt hack I don't know so so then so we're on the raft and go a couple more miles and then take a guess what jumps come flying out of the forest and and jumps in the river a salmon a car <laughs> <laughs> like and and it, it really isn't funny but but no one was hurt so I guess it is funny but seriously a car just like goes right veering off the road and just crashes like into the bank of the river like while we're on the raft. Um, so were you in a Monty Python <laughs> real life experience? <laughs> like it was just totally, so so. Windshields like totally smashed, but the people uh, were okay. And were they in the car when it went? Into I mean, the- there was a driver in the car, and and they got out, and so it was pretty intense. Uh, and then, then I'm was, never going anywhere at <laughs> these places when you're around because apparently. So I've been rafting twice, and the time before, a tree, a gigantic sequoia tree, almost crushed us. So I think we're we're never gonna go rafting again. Yeah, it's two for two crazy things. Stay happen. away from me. So, <laughs> hey, you want to go rafting? No, <laughs> unless it's on the Wii. <laughs> That's right. You can go rafting on the Wii U, which is coming out in like a couple of months. Oh, oh I didn't even realize I was segueing. <laughs> so what's different about the Wii U? So I haven't read too much about it, but um, I am posting this article, and basically. From what I've read, it uh, the controllers have like a touchscreen on them, <clears throat> and so this. Uh, did you ever use the uh, that thing where you could hook up your Game Boy Advance to the GameCube? Did you ever do that? And they had like Zelda Four Swords no. and some other games. Oh, okay. So this was totally awesome. Like this is way ahead of its time because you know nobody has four Game Boy Advances, right? So the idea is like you could play this game called Zelda Four Swords. And you would use your Game Boy Advance as connected to the GameCube. And on your screen, you would have private information, like the map, um, which you're revealing, but, but you don't want other people to see. And so as you explore the map, like as your Zelda character explores the map, you start to understand where the switches are and how to get past the door and stuff. <clears throat> but you don't want to give that information out because you want to be the first one to the finish. So that game was totally awesome. Loved it. Um, the Wii U is going to come out with games like that. They've already announced they're going to make a Zelda, pretty much like a Four Swords kind of kind of game. So really looking forward to it. Things so gonna you're going to buy one. Awesome. So you know I'm going to do what I did with the Wii, where I'm not going to be lining up at the door like killing myself, you know, to get one. But you know after like the hype has died down, maybe like six to eight months, the controllers come down in price. 
Uh, yeah, I'll probably get one. What about you? No. <laughs> You're not going to get one? No. no. I mean, maybe when it goes to forty nine ninety nine or $100 or something. How much is it right now? It looks like 300 300 That's, or That was what, the, that's what I just saw. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, what I want is to be able to do that, but with my phone. Yeah, totally. So, like, I have a phone. I have tablets, uh, probably too many. Yeah. Um, and everybody I know has them as well. Why can't I do it with that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I feel like connect exactly over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi yeah. or whatever, and I feel like that would be super awesome. Yep. I mean, I'd give my right arm for just like something that would like hold my phone, like have a little cradle for the phone, but it would be a gamepad. They have those. Oh, really? Yeah, I think oh, for the iPhones, man. I think. Oh man, where can I give my right arm? <laughs> uh oh. They have. Yeah. Well, they even have the um, retro arcade cabinet thing you can put your iPad in. Oh, I've seen. And it has like a joystick and the actual mechanical buttons. And yeah, that was pretty awesome. awesome. Yeah. And I think it connects over Bluetooth. Oh, okay. So it's that actually makes sense. so I, I mean I'm sure they have a gamepad or something like that. I, I think I've seen them before. Yeah, it just it has to be small form factor. That's the key. Or it has to like fold in on itself. Uh, or so something. like so you can put it in your pocket. Yeah, whatever, exactly. Whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there's going to be some really cool things coming out for gaming, but yeah. I find myself just playing a lot more casual games than sitting down and playing it. Just, I yeah, guess, where I am in my life, maybe? I don't know. I've been just playing sad. the, the Sims free version on the Android phone, and uh, it's pretty wild. So so this this Sims, you can't speed up time, and everything takes real time. Farmville. So <laughs> it is kind of like Farmville, it's true. But, I, you know... I you have been you have been hacked, sir. <laughs> you have brain, been exploited. My brain Prepare for your hacked. wallet to drain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's constantly like you know because uh, you can speed up time if you have money. Yeah, that's right. All if right, you have money, there you, you go. See, I, I knew there was a trick to this. Yeah, of course. So like I put all the Sims to bed at night, like right when I'm going to go to bed. And so there's something kind of creepy but cool about that. But then it's like, hey, you know, your Sims could stay up all night, you know, gaining experience if you pay, paid like, you know, a dollar or something. To you know? Chinese workers <laughs> who farmed them for you all night? <laughs> yeah. I, it, that wasn't, that wasn't, uh, I'm leading into the next story. I wasn't actually uh, trying okay. to be mean to, to Chinese people. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Chinese workers do a lot of, provide a lot of valuable service to us. So and, uh, you recently learned about that? Yeah, and there's a, an amazing tech talk. You guys should totally check it out. I'm going to have a link to it. And the uh, tech talk title is The Voice of China's Workers. And uh, just supremely interesting story. I'll just cover some of the most interesting parts. One is um, all of them walk around, like all of the workers, they go home with to visit their families and stuff. And they bring with them like iPads and coach purses and stuff like that. And like designer coach purses because they, since they work in the factory, they get these at like ridiculous prices. So like this lady, she the said, ones with little blemishes or just like no, just well kind of, possibly it okay. wasn't said, but uh, <clears throat> but yeah, this reporter was like she you know she had followed like several of these women who worked in a coach uh, purse you know factory, and yeah, after six months they uh, they gave her like just you know twenty or thirty coach purses and some other stuff, and she's like you know no give this money to your family, and they're like what are you talking about? Like, this is like 13 cents or something to us, you oh. know? <laughs> and there's like a hundred X markup. That same coach purse sold for like $1,200 or something. Uh. And so just, and they actually, you know, they're not oblivious. They know how much the things are sold for in America. But in they, fact, they can't, like there's no way for them to be able to sell them there. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so they walk around saying like, this coach purse sells for 6000 Like leave, It's like the equivalent of like leaving the price tag on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They leave the American price tag on like the, pur the purses and stuff, but they couldn't sell it for a dollar. I guess it's always the interesting thing, right? People talk about that we put so much value on things in, in dollar amounts, but then like if you're stranded on a desert island, like that stuff's worthless to you. Like you yeah. don't have food and water and it's like the, st it's really all relative. Yeah. Like how much something's worth. So if you, you know, if you're in China and you, there's nowhere for you to sell them and these purses are in high supply and they, they don't, they don't hold value. You can't do anything with them except maybe like burn them for like fuel <laughs> to heat burn. yourself or yeah, try totally. to like trade them for other, like collect them all like Pokemon or something. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, this is not like, I, I don't know. Like, Totally. Yeah. The, the other interesting thing is they, a lot of them don't feel like they're being mistreated. Like the hours are harsh, but, but there's a, I guess in the Chinese culture, they're used to working like really long hours, even when they work in the fields. Like a lot of them come from, from rural, you know, backgrounds where they worked a lot of hours there. They said that the thing that they really want is education. 
And then mm. it's really hard for these factory workers to even like learn English and things like that. Because it takes a lot of time. Like you have to spend a lot of time to learn. Yeah, and there's just no opportunities. Like there's just no, mm. they don't have classes or anything like that. And so I thought that was interesting, you know. And in fact, the, the beginning of the talk was like, you know, you guys are going to think that these workers are oppressed and they're just like slaving away. But the reality is that the things they want aren't what you think they'd want. Hmm. And I thought, and you know, the whole thing is interesting. You guys should definitely check it out. Yeah. Um, and, and we definitely weren't trying to be mean to, to anybody. Just no, no, not at all. all. Yeah. yeah. And you can check it out by connecting your Raspberry Pi up to your television if you have one. <laughs> yeah. Did you get yours or did you, did you never actually no, order one? No, I ended up, so yeah, basically I just decided I was either going to get a Raspberry Pi or an iPhone developer's license. Because okay. they're both around the same amount. Okay. And so I just went with the iPhone developers. Oh, okay. Things. I see. I see. Um, yeah. So so Raspberry Pi, we've talked about these uh, small devices before. And they finally come into, I guess, wide-scale distribution after having like a huge back order and not making them very uh, in very high quantities. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people are started to come out with interesting projects. And this one is a, a guy at a university and his son um, built a supercomputer out of Raspberry Pis and Legos. So awesome. um, the son had actually been learning uh, programming through one of MIT's like more visual programming languages called Scratch. I, I don't know much about it. Maybe we'll have to look into it in the future. Oh, Add yeah. it to the list. Add it to the um, list. Scratch. Scratch. And uh, so they, they networked them all together. They put all the you know uh, high performance computing stack on it. Things like MPI message passing interface. Yeah. Hopefully. Yep. Okay. And, uh, totally. Um, things like that. And the interesting thing is they didn't have a lot of performance statistics that I saw in the article reading briefly. But what's interesting is that um, you know it's very difficult for for universities or small scale people to learn um, the how to write programs for this style of computing. So yeah. even if it's not a top 100 supercomputer that you're building, just having something that's more than five or six machines, but something that is like you know, 20, 30, 40 machines and understanding where the bottlenecks are and how to write code for that and how to optimize. This is like very important to do, but could be very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so this person spent about $4,000, it said, to make this and it'll be a, you know, invaluable learning tool. Now, 4,000 is a little bit much for like a side hobby. So you know, <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably hopefully for, for the university itself, but it's definitely an awesome learning experience that speaks to the interesting things you can do with stuff like this. I'd also yeah, be this picture is amazing. You guys should definitely read this article. Yeah, so, so the built the racks and cases out of Lego. <laughs> it's yeah. phenomenal. It, it's, it is really cool. Um, and then you know hooked them all together with. It's amazing you know, that the the circuit board is like laid out in such a way where the Lego could perfectly fit. You know, I mean that's yeah. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's also interesting that it's like the scale, right? Like how small it is that Legos are about the right size. <laughs> yeah, like exactly. you don't need. It's like. Four or five Legos, like three Legos in one dimension and like four Legos in the other. Yeah. It's like not a lot of Legos um, that you need. <laughs> this is, look at the so power scale, adapter. Yeah, the power, this is okay. so awesome. <laughs> uh, we can see that Jason read the stories in advance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally busted. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is very interesting. And the other thing I'd be curious is, is people doing, and I've seen some stuff similar with uh, Amazon. The, uh, their cloud computing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, bringing up a bunch of computers there so you can practice and do um, large scale supercomputing style work and kind of yeah, learn totally. work on it. Actually, along those lines, there's this thing called a Common Crawl. Have you seen this? No. So, Common Crawl is a 60 terabyte snapshot of the internet. Yeah. And uh, so, what you can do, they, they have actually they have code contests constantly with different themes, which is kind of fun. But um, if you have an Amazon um, account, which you know, if you're a student, you can get one at a at a discount or even free. Um, you can write, you know, sort of algorithms that work on the entire internet, on and they run an Amazon EC2. And so, um, Common Crawl is a way to sort of make it easy for people to write things like, oh, what's the co-occurrence matrix of every word on the internet, or oh, like. Let's try and do something cool with like all of the Twitter, you know, data that's public or you know things like that. So um, they they do a lot of fun stuff. You guys should definitely check out. Comic Interesting, Comic. yeah, that sounds cool. It's another way to sort of like teach people about you know super parallel. Yeah, I mean big data, right? Like I guess yeah. that's the the buzzword for it. But yeah. it really is important. We see it out here being being where we are in California. Every everybody everything's all about big data. Yeah. How Billboards on the side of the road. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. But it, it is true, like, you have to take special care when you get into 
data that starts off the sentence like, for every website in the web, count <laughs> yeah. the number of times a word occurs, right? How do you handle that? What data structures do you use? This is very valuable. Um, yeah. And it is a good skill to have if you're trying to learn stuff. Yeah, totally, totally. So our, our final news article is, is kind of a, a little bit silly, but somebody uh, wrote about making a Turing complete computer using three Magic the Gather Gathering cards. So Magic the Gathering uh, brings a little nostalgia for me, um, is a collectible card game. So it's a card game that has you know, all these different kinds of cards, and some are rare and very rare, and some are very common, and there's a you know, set of rules, and basically you try to build up a deck that's your favorite deck, and you, know, you play your buddies you know, with, with your cards and see who's, <laughs> who's the best or whatever. Um, yeah. This was before the internet was really big. Well, maybe it was, it was different than it was today, so we did had to you, like, spend time outside. Did you get outside. into it? Not, so into it was different. I never like, so it can be very expensive to like, acquire the yeah. very rare cards and stuff, although they've gone up in value. Like, I kind of wish I had bought them and then yeah. like, sold them today. Um, but we would play, we would go buy, we would go to the store that sold them and buy the like, pack of common cards, yeah. like the box of like, 400 for like five dollars and then we would just play games me my brothers and i right yeah, like i did the same thing the really school. cheap stuff and it was the, our decks were horrible right but it didn't matter because as long as everybody else's deck is horrible it's still fun yep um so anyways uh, if you've never heard of it before you can check it out there's actually they recently released a, a um a program for magic the gathering that has a lot of cards in it and hosts oh, games cool. online so i think they have like an ipad iphone and it's actually considering how much it can be to buy a, a real deck and kind of play it. it it's it's fairly affordable. Is it? I do guess. you have to pay per card? So the way I, I think it works is like you can buy pre-constructed decks of cards, or you can pay for like random things similar to like buying oh, booster packs or whatever. Um, which is kind of interesting. Maybe we'll have to talk about gaming sometime because a lot yeah, of cool definitely. games. But uh, so this person found essentially Turing Complete is uh, named after Alan Turing, who showed that. There exists a computer that, if it can do a certain set of uh, routines, can perform any computing function. It can compute anything yep. that's possible or whatever. Um, so it's essentially showing that if you have a programming language or a computer that's Turing complete, that given enough time and possibly infinite time, it can accomplish a comp a, any given computing task. Right. And so this person um, had three cards with unique properties that involve counters. And the idea of a Turing machine is it's a tape head moving on an infinite tape and kind of storing data in one place and then having an instruction that tells it what to move left or right or you know and then what to do when it gets there that kind of thing and so they were able to do that with these three cards this is kind of interesting it's kind of silly but it's kind of fun to read about and yeah it's amazing yeah it's yeah. what people do these things every once in a while build the working computer out of legos or ball bearings or you know magic the gathering cards did you see the one in minecraft that was made out of minecraft animals and water not, oh, I haven't seen that one, no. Oh. <laughs> I've seen the ones where they use the, what is that called, the redstone, and make the oh, wires. Yeah. And actually, people built, like, a game. So, like, it have a giant screen that displays stuff and has a graphics processing unit and, like, <laughs> everything. Awesome. Oh, man, it's such crazy. That's great. Uh, I, I guess that's one of those things that people say about Guitar Hero or whatever. Like, if you spend that much time playing Guitar Hero, you should just learn to play real guitar. <laughs> you that's not exactly the truth. But it's the same thing, like, oh, you just spend that much time, like, creating Minecraft things, like... That's crazy. Like it's awesome and it's dedication and, and they're having fun. So more power to them. Like I don't think. But it's like wow. Like I wonder what other stuff you could do with that much time. Like yeah, I noticed. I was watching a YouTube video the other day where somebody had a like a Minecraft. I guess you could export your world and like send it to people okay. and they could import it. And this guy had made a world which was like a RPG. Oh. And you had to like the thing is the onus was on you to follow the rules. Like of course you could just punch your way through the wall and be done. But like assuming you followed the rules, like it was this like pretty fun like semi random like like RPG, and uh, I thought that was awesome. And so I think there needs to be like a database of like Minecraft worlds. There probably is, dude. There's like everything. Yeah, so true. it's so interesting Minecraft that the the guy Marcus Pierce is it Marcus Pierce? Yeah, Marcus not, not person, or person. I don't know. How, okay, yeah. oh, they call him Notch. Or yeah. Whatever it is. Um, you know, he like made something that. You know, it took him some time and work, and he's kind of become famous. But a lot of it is due to the openness. Like, not just the game is an open world, but like it's open to modification and sharing levels and hacking yep. save games and creating macros. And people, 
and he kind of incorporates stuff that people do and like brings it back in and now he doesn't actually work on it anymore he has his team works on it or whatever and he does other stuff yeah he's working on a space the sim, space right? one yeah. yeah I don't know how you say it but you can yeah, look it up it. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of similar so it's interesting that he embraced the openness of the community so much and that they've really kind of embraced him back and yeah. people see these crazy YouTube videos and then go buy a copy of his game right yep. so. yeah I was thinking about getting it for the phone I just don't know how how good it's going to be I have it for my Xbox and oh, the really? cool thing about the Xbox is since the game really is meant to kind of run in like 640 by 480 or 800 by 600, because it's really pixelated and blocky, so you can make it bigger, but you're not really getting any more data on the screen. Right. Um, and so I have like a nice TV, you know, HD resolution, and the Xbox can push that, so you can actually play four players simultaneously oh, on one screen, wow. like sitting there with Xbox controllers, and you, although your screen gets smaller, right, like you still have the same data that's on there yeah and so it, it works pretty well so that's cool I play man. with people sitting in the same room which is is kind of fun yeah yeah that's great but i don't I'll have it on my that. phone yet yeah i'll probably get the demo maybe today or tomorrow and see all right how it is. So, so if you don't do any work for <laughs> yeah, the next exactly. week or two i actually so the reason why i don't have it on my phone is uh because of our tool of the bye week uh -oh, tool of the we didn't say it in sync uh, okay, continue. Uh, our three, two, tool. Oh, uh, oh, I missed it again. Okay, oh, just yeah. continue. Just go. All right. So my tool of the bye week is uh, actually game Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. Are you going to waste more of my time? Like, am I literally this going is, to risk getting fired for not doing work? This might this might cause you to get uh, fired, but it'll be worth it. You'll be you'll be you'll be. A wait, happy how can you fire. determine if it's worth it for me? Actually, worth it might not be the best choice of words. <laughs> But uh, so this is, I picked this for a number of reasons. Uh, one is um, it has an awesome tutorial, which is something that like roguelikes, which this is a roguelike, um, are notoriously bad at. Like if you go to play NetHack, it starts off, you know, pick your role, pick your race. You don't know what any of them really are. And then it's like, go. Yeah, and try it's Dwarf like, Fortress. <laughs> yeah, Dwarf Fortress is the worst. Right? I would kill to have an awesome tutorial. They have a Fortress. book. That people are like raving about. That really? like it's so it's kind of crazy. You have like to read like a book, textbook. Like, <laughs> it's like a uh, dwarf fortress for idiots or something. It's like an O'Reilly book has yeah. an owl on so, it. No, no, actually, I think it is O'Reilly, <laughs> but it's not an owl. Like it's all right. Let me look it up right now. Oh, but I'm, I'm really tempted to buy because everybody who gets in this game just says it's amazing. Yeah, and like all dwarf these like fortress. really famous people. Yep. Like even even Notch, right? Like the yep. guy who made Minecraft. Like he took inspiration from like it's so dwarf fortress. My favorite game of all time. For people who don't know. Um, it's amazing. But yeah, you're a gigantic learning curve. Yeah, I really want to get into it, but yeah. it's like I'd have to invest so much time just to get started. And then, like, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Then I'm going to spend tons more time yeah. exploring the, it. The, the reason why Dwarf Fortress is great, just if I had to say it in one sentence, it would be you know, it takes like the best of Minecraft, which is a creative, like, building part, but it puts it in an environment where you really want it. It puts it in a sim. Like, like in Minecraft, you have to actually walk across the map, right? Or like, you have to build a house, and you know what you want to build, but you have to click on all the blocks, right? So Door Fortress, you can lay out like a little floor plan and give orders, and then your guys can go around, you know, doing these little orders. And also, it has permadeath, you know, because you have all these dwarfs and you're getting like a new supply of dwarfs, if you make a mistake, like you dig too deep and there are monsters you can't handle, um, your dwarfs die. And so that permadeath gives you like a level of suspense that I feel like you don't really have as much in Minecraft. So, wow. um, totally so the game, awesome. the game, the book is called "Getting Started with Dwarf Fortress" by <laughs> O'Reilly. I've heard good things about it. Like people, like it's, it's supposed to be really, really good. So if you're interested in Dwarf Fortress and like wasting I'm months of your life, definitely buying that book. So, you know, if you do, let me know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'll loan it to you. Once <laughs> okay, all right, there you go. There you go. No, please don't. My wife, my wife <laughs> yeah. might like not be very happy with you or me. <laughs> and so, also, not not just Marcus person. Yep. Here's a P E R. -R. Anyways, yeah. So we're probably saying it wrong, but nah. it's okay. we're giving them credit. So, so back to your topic, oh, which yeah. I totally derailed. So, so uh, yeah, no worries. So this has Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup has an amazing tutorial, and it teaches you about you know getting started with the game, the different keys. You know, um, some things that a lot of people who play NetHack and Slash and these roguelikes, the thing they don't realize is if you um, hold Shift and you move a direction, your character will walk that many steps until he either like hits a wall or hits like something interesting and so a lot of people don't know that and so they keep hitting like left 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 and they're just wasting a lot of time you know because the game is like kind of turn-based it's like designed for you to be able to sort of macro and there's all these macros and uh, they're all common across all these roguelikes so dungeon crawl stone soup's a way to sort of 
get you in there and get you like working in roguelikes, playing roguelikes like at the pace they're meant to be played, and just getting like a ton more fun out of your roguelike. Um, on top of the tutorial, it's also just an all-around great game. Like I've, I haven't played a lot of it yet, but um, has like a wide array of different spells and abilities you can use, and races and classes. And yeah, I've heard um, good stuff about yeah. this as like an introduction to roguelikes. Yeah, it's totally. Supposed to be really good, but it's also really deep, right? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, definitely. I have it on my phone, and uh, so it's been it's been pretty fun. I'm looking I, at the screenshots and how deep and cool and nerdy this looks. <laughs> yeah. There's something appealing. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, right, something that looks very difficult and very nerdy and like elitist. Like you want to do it just because yep. like you want to. It's like, what do they call it? Wearing the hair shirt or whatever? Yeah, exactly. So it's, like, it's like, you want to put on the thing that's itchy and bothers you just to, like, prove, like, yep. to, I am elite nerd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the um, the uh, they post the high scores, and they post a list of all the people who have completed the game online. So that can get pretty addictive. Like, you want to be on that list. Mm, you know? I don't think so. Oh, really? I think that's like, a, like, you make it there, and you feel so proud of yourself for, like, a day. And then you look at it, and you're just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> it's like getting the high I'm score in an arcade game until they reset it, right? Like, and then I'm it's still like, proud oh. of, so NetHack has a, has a server of it, like this, this sort too. And I've ascended in NetHack on the server, and I'm still proud of it to this day. Like I still, every now and then I look back, and I'm like, yeah. Good and, job. Good job, and, sir. Pat on the back. And Slashem, which is a harder version of NetHack, also has this. And I've tried, you know, on you and off for half better of nerd my than life, I. and I've never done it. <laughs> Never ascended in. Uh, One time I went like halfway, which you know is like forty hours of gameplay. And I don't. By the way, if you're a game developer or thinking about becoming a game developer, please stop putting how many hours I've played your game. Oh, I know. Please it's stop. So bad. Please Why stop. Do that. Don't do that. Um, please Steam don't. does that on all the games now, uh, and it just makes me depressed every time I look at it. Yeah. Okay. My <laughs> my tool of the bye week is not a game. <laughs> yeah. It's Wireshark. That's a great tool. So, so Wireshark used to be called something before uh, Ethereal. I, yeah, I that's right. Yeah. So this is the kind of thing that you either love and you use it all the time or you hate and you've never used it before or like you get into a bind and you don't know how to do something or what to do and then you, you use this. And that is anytime you're going to do like network programming and yeah. it's so hard to tell what's happening when you try to open that socket and it just doesn't work. You don't know if packets are getting there. Are they mis malformed? Like what, what's going yeah. on? And Wireshark is kind of the answer to that. Or if you're like using BitTorrent and it's telling you, hey, you know, your your port is closed or whatever, and you just can't seem to figure it out. Like Wireshark will tell you, like, oh, you know, you have packets coming out of your computer, so it must be somewhere else in the chain. Yeah. So like what that. Wireshark does is it puts your um, your Ethernet port into a mode where basically it can read all of the packets you're getting along with everything else still getting the packets like normal. So everything acts like normal, but Wireshark is getting a copy of all the packets as well. And then it what it does is just kind of displays like a hex dump of the packets, like the header, yep. the information, whatever. But then it has these processors that get layered on top to understand like HTTP traffic. So like, oh, this is a Git request, you know, and it'll actually like try to kind of tell you in an intelligent, readable way all of those things that you might want to know about that kind of information. Yeah. And it's just one of those things, like if you need this, it's just really valuable and works really well. Um, awesome. But it can be, it's, it's like a power user's tool. Like, 90% of people probably never, who do a lot of computer programming, never use it and never get into it. But, you know, it can be really helpful and it's good to know about. Yeah, definitely. No, this is Especially great. if doing any kind of network development. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing... I made that 90% up. Now I'm thinking about I have no idea what percentage. <laughs> like 99. But <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, oh, okay. Sorry. But, uh, but no, it's <laughs> awesome. Um, I wrote a peer-to-peer -peer app and uh, Wireshark was like crucial because, I mean, you know, you it was sort of kind of like based on a heuristic who would connect to who and things like that. And Wireshark like explicitly was telling me, oh, you know, these ports are talking to these ports, you know, on the same machine and things like that. So so uh, if you're doing any kind of network programming, this will save your life. Yep. Save your time. All right. Time for BASIC. So the history of, of BASIC is that it was created in Dartmouth College out of a, a research paper. Yep. So some programming languages are created by programmers and some by researchers who I guess could be considered programmers as well. Yeah. But we're kind of doing research topic and, and we're talking like way back in the day. So what we're saying is like the 60s or pre-60s, like in the 50s. Yeah, totally. Um, actually, we should like get the early the year. 60s. I'm totally unprepared. For uh, I'll look this it's up. It's okay. <laughs> and it was based on 1964. a 1964. 1964, all right. And so it's called Beginners All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. So yeah, in the whole that's what the acronym is. The acronym, so basic. And the whole idea was that 
you know, there were programming languages at the time, but it all kind of like assumed you were like a hardcore programmer, like you wanted to really get into this, and this was supposed to be accessible, which I, I mean, I, I think it succeeds at. Yeah, like totally. I mean, like it trying to, and this is something we we talked about a little before we we started the show. Jason and I both have, we'll get to him in a minute. You know, experiences with basic, but I mean, this idea, this romantic notion of creating a programming language where you just describe in English sentences or insert whatever language you, you speak, a native language, <laughs> yeah. you know, just normal conversational text to a computer yeah. and have it do what you want. I mean, this is like the Jetsons, right? You tell Rosie, like, hey, I need this, right? And you just speak to the computer normally and it decides what to do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's you can't get more accessible than, you know, it being your operating system, right? Like you turn on the computer and basic starts, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, so that was the way, you know, Commodore 64s, TRS-80s, Apple IIs, yep. right? They boot them up and they just were in a basic interpreter yeah and it worked well for that because you could say things like it wasn't print f or c out or what are these things it was like print and then you just gave it you know this thing you wanted it to print and then the next line you you say print hello world and the next line go to previous line right go to (laughs) 10 10 print hello world 20 go to 10 you know yeah if you think about it go to's are so you know you hear all these things like go to is evil and all stuff and then somebody proved that you know this wasn't a hard proof or anything but that you could basically like if you use for loops and breaks and returns um you can like take any program that has go to's and turn it into for loops and breaks right so go to's aren't necessary yeah so yeah they're not necessary and, and they're also not evil like you could do the same thing you could do you could do equally evil things without using go to um but but there's there's a appeal to it you know the idea that like I'm going to label this line as like line eight and then somewhere else like go to eight. Like it's so much more intuitive than like a for loop where you have to like count up and each time this I has a different value. And, you know, it might not be the most useful, but for somebody who's just starting out, it, it, it makes more sense. Like they look at that and they know immediately what's going yeah, on. Yeah, it is true. I mean, the for loop concept takes a while to, to get around. You just kind of have to get to that epiphany stage like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. And I mean, the whole issue that as programmers we understand is you need to be able to be very precise to the, and, and actually saying go to this line. I mean, that's like very, if you say return, it's like return to what? And early basic didn't have um, functions or procedures is just you know straight yep. down the line imperative programming just you know yeah, actually, line after line we should mention that we're not covering visual basic yes okay <laughs> but we'll go through so like yeah. the first generations of basic right like there was yep. you had to have every number lined you know there weren't procedures you could do these go to's and you could have you know kind of boolean statements or whatever yeah so for people who don't know um, the way the way the computer and Patrick will probably know a lot better than I will so I'll let him correct me but the uh the way I understand it is you have a program counter. So, you know, if you have the a multi thread The CPU has a program yeah, counter. Yeah, the CPU has a program counter for each thread, right, which says, like, what instruction that thread is on. Or in the case of basic, you just have one, which is for your, for your thread. Um, and so it just, the program counter keeps stepping through until it encounters, like, a branch. So a branch might be, a, you know, an if statement. So if something is true, then you're going to go to the next program counter. Otherwise, you're going to skip all the way down to the end of that if block, right? Or, or a go to is an explicit branch. You're actually saying, you know, take the program counter and set it to this other instruction. Well, in basic, it makes that like very explicit. Like in the first version of basic, you literally wrote the program counter for all of your instructions. Yeah, well, so you write the memory location essentially is what you're doing. So right. you, we say 10, and that's like line number, because line numbers don't have to be sequential. But you're essentially kind of stating like this is an abstracted version of memory. So mm-hmm. the the processor would just execute the first memory instruction, then go to the next one, and go to the next one, until I encounter, like you said, one of these things which said, t- affect the program counter in this way. Yep. Change it to this, or you know, minus one, or plus one, or whatever. you know. And so basic, yeah, you... You had to put the line numbers there so you knew where you were, and they had to be increasing so that you would, you know, keep moving forward in the in the memory and, and going yep. up, unless you, you know, did a go to. And then the second generation, you know, oh, we should say that Microsoft got its start, um, yeah, in, in creating a version of BASIC, um, and that that's kind of where they started. So uh, we won't get into that large history, but uh, I don't you know, know if this is still true, but the last time I checked, which was XP. It actually has QBasic in it. Oh. Like if you just scan your whole computer for QBasic.exe. Now, I don't know anything about Vista or 7, um, but I know like 98 and XP in these nice. 2000 nice. actually had QBasic. And uh, they actually, in the same directory, there is a bananas.bas, 
and it's a game where you're like a monkey and you have to throw a banana. It's, okay. a, it's a game I, I think I have to I, face it. I don't believe you. I'm going to go try I'm going to go try out. this right now. <laughs> um, so that was the first generation of basic and then the second generation came out and you know this is quick basic like you're talking about Cubase so this is mm -hmm. where this came out and these you didn't have to put line numbers if you didn't want you could have more like just labels as opposed to line numbers um, and then you could actually have procedures so okay, essentially functions you could go to a function and then like we said that notion of return from a function is kind of vague like where are you returning to well it depends on where you came from yep. so when you say go to you're going to a line and then you have to later you say go to some other line like you, it's not just like go the return is go to something that was stored previously and that's right. the the stack so the stack will store have we talked about the stack no i don't think we have all right why don't you cover it i think uh, you'd be an expert okay. on this pa so, so for people who don't know patrick majored in computer engineering and i majored in computer science and then that that alone makes him like much more applied and know things which are useful. I mean, no crazy. I think we're overstating this. <laughs> <laughs> but then, like on top of that, I did all theory. Like I tried to stay away from all the like databases and networking, and so that makes me even more, even like less useful when it comes to, like close to the metal Aww. stuff. So, so Patrick, why don't you okay. explain? Okay, we'll probably Okay, so a stack is a data structure but also it's something that is represented in the hardware in CPUs, mm -hmm. and it is what's called a last in, first out data structure. So this implies that the last piece of data that you gave to the data structure, when you go to get something from it, it'll be the first thing that comes out. Right. So think of it as like, it's called a stack, it's like a stack of papers. If you put one paper down, then put another on top and another on top, when you go to pull that last one, to pull the one on top, it's the most recent one you put there. Yep. So if you think about functions, that's the way it works. So if I have function A, calls function B, calls function C. When I return from C, I want to go back to B. And then when I return from B, I want to go back to A. So I want to go in the reverse order that I just came. And so that's what this return does. So you need somewhere to stick this address of where you came from, this, the stack, the, um, yeah, the pointer, the program counter yep. of where you came from. So you stick it on one of these stack structures and then you go to your other function. And then when that function finishes or calls another function, but when it finishes and returns, it takes the thing on the stack and goes jumps to that location and hopefully if everything worked out right and nothing bad had happened you'll go back to where you left so the if you were in function a and you called function b it did its magic and then returned then you'll be back one line past the line where you called function b and function a yep. so that line plus one and that's also how um things get passed to functions so you also stick the things the parameters you're calling the function with you stick them on the stack and they get pop back off too. So and that's how things get returned as well. So you can you know, get the, th the results of the function as it were. And so that's what the, the second generation did um, of, of basic was add these procedures and allow for procedural programming, yeah. which, is, which comes before object oriented programming, which is what the third generation <laughs> attempted to do. And that's where you get things like um, visual basics so of VB script, which is a way to script Microsoft products, maybe others as well. I don't, I don't know the licensing agreements there. <laughs> and like visual basic.net yep. um, and these kinds of things. They try to introduce um, the notions of object-oriented programming to basic, but we're not really going to talk about those today. This is an, a nostalgia trip. Yeah, totally. I mean, VB.net has all sorts of awesome stuff in it, and we'll cover it in another show, but, uh, but uh, today we're going to just focus on basic. So, you know, we both had experiences doing this, and we, you know, it's one of the things that I consider programming in basic to not have been really programming. You know, it was, yeah. and it is, yeah. but I fooled around with various, you know, like I said, the Print. Oh, we, I guess I didn't say this on air. So it's like, you know, my first program, I remember, is like 10, print Patrick rules, 20, go to 10, <laughs> execute, right? And then Patrick, like rules, Patrick rules, rules, Patrick rules, Patrick rules, Patrick rules, Patrick rules, Patrick rules, Patrick rules, <laughs> like all the way down. Yeah. And then like you like call in your brother, hey, look, man, the computer Patrick knows I rules. <laughs> yeah, uh, we would have this arms race. So my cousins were all kind of techies and most of them were older than me. And so we all had like the Commodore 64 manual and we used this as sort of a way to sort of like see who the alpha programmer was at the time. So, you know, someone started with the, you know, 10 print, you know, Lin rules, 20 go to 10. And my cousin was like, check it out, you know. And then I figured out a way to uh, like print mine so that it like moved, it like kind of bounced left and right on the bottom of the screen. Cause like it just go back to 10, but it put a bunch of spaces in front. And so it looked like it was kind of bouncing. And then, uh, like, another one of my cousins found out you could actually write to specific places on the screen. Like, you could say, I want, like, this row and column to have, like, a letter in it. 
And so she actually made her name like bounce out, like as if it was a little pong ball or something. Ah, yeah. Yeah, it was super fun. It, so I mean, but that kind of encouraging that kind of fun experimentation is really a good way to learn. Yeah, you know, totally. Uh, it takes it's still another leap to go to programming as a you know getting things done kind of thing. Yep. Um, but those still, those early lessons are valuable, and the fact that it's so approachable, basic was for kids. Like it's it's easy to get started in, and even though you might move on to other stuff, those those early lessons, you know about. You know, oh, I want to move, but then I want to go back at some time. So I need some sort of loop that's counting, yeah. right? You're introducing kind of, even if you don't know it, you're learning these for loops. And then later when you learn the proper concepts, you can map them back to those early things that you were doing. Yeah. I mean, I noticed that like I've taken a lot of different classes and things like just on the web. Like I recently took a Rails for Zombies. Have you seen this oh, class? I have seen that one. Yeah. I took this class and uh, and pretty much nothing stuck. So now you're a zombie. <laughs> yes, brains, rails. So oh. nothing stuck. And like when I went to make a, I recently made a website in Rails, I forgot everything. Like everything I had to go back and relearn. And the thing is when you are, like when you have a vision in mind, whether it's printing your name over and over again or making a website or whatever, and you're learning something as part of fulfilling that vision, that's when it seems to stick. You know, it's so much more effective than trying to learn something through a class or, or something like that. Yeah, so, that's true, that's true. And basic gives you the ability, it's easy enough where you can start with zero. You know, like you can start not knowing anything about programming and just have like a vision of, oh, I want to make like a little dot move around the screen or something. I mean, you can't have a huge, you can't say I want to make you know, Quake or something I like that. I was just that. thinking Quake. Oh, <laughs> That's awesome. Or, or, you know, Minecraft or something. Or Fortress. Like, yes. I, maybe, you could actually, uh, that might not be out of bounds. But anyways, so um, if, you, if you have the book, apparently. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but, you know, if you have, a, like, a simple vision, you could start with nothing, just start typing in basic, and every time you can't do something, you look it up on the Internet and make, get your way through it. And you, it'll be just an incredibly fulfilling learning experience. So, I mean, we, in some ways, I guess, as programmers, you move on from basic. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there are a lot of people who get valuable paying jobs, you know, just writing, you know, essentially basic style things. And, and that's great. And um, it is amazing that something that was written so long ago kind of still sticks around, even if it's yeah. not vitally important like it once was you know it's still with us like we all have fond memories of it there's still you know things you can find we'll talk about later like on the internet or whatever you can just find versions of it free that keep being updated and yep. every version of windows apparently was shipping with, <laughs> with a version of basic yeah totally so, yeah i mean th there's uh so there's vba which is visual basic for applications and uh, it actually started off as just i guess ba <laughs> but like in earlier really early versions of excel and stuff like that and you would just write basic to you know, manipulate the cells and things like that. And there's people who, as Patrick said, just do this even to this day. Yeah. Um, I mean, so we traditionally go through like strengths and weaknesses. I mean, we can do that. It's, it's a little a little strange for this one, but yeah. I mean, the strengths it's it's so like Jason said, it's so easy to sit down with essentially a, a blank line and get something to happen, and that's really rewarding. Yay! I made the computer do something, right? Like I programmed yeah. it, um, and that's amazing. And that that's in part due to the approachable syntax. I mean, it does read a lot. Like we said, instead of like printf or see out it it's like print go to if right i mean these things are somewhat more uh, understandable and closer to what people know already in their in their you know normal way of communicating yeah and something that i just remembered uh when i was in college there's this guy who was going crazy over dark basic Dark? And, uh, Is that like the vampire basic? <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like Rails for Zombies. Oh! There's a, a lot in common. But so dark basic is, um, I think it's commercial. Uh, let me see. You, you write games in um, this. I, I, I think I do remember this. Yeah. 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 So it actually allow you to do like graphics programming and stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's free or not. But basically, it's a way to get access to DirectX, which is Microsoft's like rendering library, like a rendering platform. Mm. And so you can write basic programs, but instead of just kind of printing your name and doing cheesy things that we were talking about, you could actually like create like little sprites. You could load images and have them like move around. And so for people out there like budding game designers uh, and, and uh, people who want to sort of like write a game really quick but have no experience in programming, you should definitely check out uh, Dark Basic. Yeah, I remember, I mean, those were the first games I wrote. Not that I've written many games, but, you know, <laughs> something like you were talking about, but I actually, like, there was a way to draw to the screen, and so I would learn yeah. about, like, erasing the screen and then drawing a little square and making it bounce off the corners and learned about 
flipping the velocities, right? Which I didn't yeah. know what it was a term, but like, oh, I need to move five pixels to the right. But when I hit the screen, I need to know where the screen's at. And then I need to make that negative and move plus minus five pixels, right? And, yeah. and like learning how like that's how that works and figuring it out and that sense of triumph you have. And then also I made like, try to make like a little Pac-Man thing where the mouth would open and close. Oh, Only nice. instead of using, which later learned, you have, they have sprites to do that, right? Like just various animation. I would actually draw like, a pie circle oh, like with wow. the angle and then the angle would get smaller and bigger right oh, and that's it would kinda, awesome <laughs> kind of go across and yeah you, know, you don't know any difference so you just make do so this is kind of like a little segue here but um they i was reading this really interesting article on uh i've been doing a lot of drawing lately as, as you know i mentioned a while ago and maybe in an earlier episode and i have uh, one of those wacom tablets uh those usb drawing tablets and uh i've been reading a lot of books and papers on drawing as well and one of the things that I thought was just fascinating, and I didn't believe it until I actually saw examples of it, is if you have two frames, so imagine like you have one frame where Pac-Man's mouth is open and another frame where his mouth is closed, and you just like flip-flop between these two frames, it will look like weird and cheesy and it won't look right. But if you have three frames, or I guess in this case five frames, so you have like mouth open, halfway closed, closed, halfway closed, open. Like if you just add that third frame, there's something in your brain where your brain can't remember three frames back and it looks like fluid motion. Uh. Like this sounds crazy, but if you just Google that or something, or maybe I'll post a link on the blog, they have examples where they show like a kick. So almost all of the Street Fighter 2 is like three frames, like all the kicks and punches. Like it feels really fluid, but it's just three frames. And they take out the middle frame and just it's just dramatic. Like it just, you look at this and you're like, this is garbage. I guess it makes sense because the guy's standing there, not punching, and then the arm is all the way out. But you don't really know how it got there. Yeah. But if you draw one in the middle, like yeah, it's just you, you kind of your brain how fills three in. is interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's just shocking. Like three is like the magic number, and it's based on some psycholo- psychological interesting, interesting. or neuroscientific thing. Yeah. So so weaknesses of basic. We've been singing the praises of basic. <laughs> yeah. So be the bearer of bad news. Yeah, sadly, basic is not going to let you make you know Quake Three. <laughs> yeah, it uh, well you know maybe dark basic will, but of course you're leveraging all those C plus plus libraries. But you know basic by itself, it's just uh, it, not only because it's interpreted because we've talked about interpreted languages before, but specifically basic, just kind of the way that it's designed with like no um, you know stack frame stack you know stack frames. You have to like manually you know manage that yourself and. There's a lot of other reasons. It'll never be uh, like high performing. Uh, the other thing is it doesn't have a lot of the bells and whistles that would make your life easy as a developer. So it doesn't have multi-threading, it doesn't have object-oriented pro- paradigm. It, uh, so you know it's not going to let you make that killer app. You know at least it's going to teach you what you need to know to get there. But yeah, yeah. it definitely still has its uses. Yeah, totally. um, and then tools like we said, there are many versions of uh, Free Basic that are around. It's actually yeah. really hard to search for Basic, <laughs> as I found yeah. out, because uh, Basic programming, and then they just like talk about introduction to programming. It's like, no, <laughs> yeah. I want Basic <laughs> programming, not simple Java. programming. <laughs> uh, so it is a little hard to, to search for, um, mm-hmm. but but you can find information about it. And there are many uh, like web-based versions, free yeah. interpreters to download. And it's still a great thing to start today. I, I think if you have kids or you do one day, I think it'd be a great way to introduce them. Yeah. Um. You know, to to programming. And this, like I said, this is how my earliest programming was was done in BASIC. Yeah. And uh, BASIC is. I don't know if this is still true. It probably is. But it's in all the Texas Instruments calculators. So you know, when you get that fancy like scientific calculator in like seventh grade or sixth grade, whenever they start requiring that. Um, you can program in it. You can make games in BASIC, as we both did. Yeah, we were so we were school. actually talking about this. So <laughs> getting one when we were in high school, I had a TI-83, I think it was. But I think even like 82s, and I don't remember all the numbers now. Yeah, I had Numbering an 82. Yeah. Okay. They, yeah, they had a version of BASIC, and you had to type on the like keys weirdly to get the letters. Yep. And somehow, yep. like I guess as crazy as we think it is, people doing the SMS messaging on like the 9 or 10. Yeah, the 10, T9. Oh, thing. man. Um, but people doing the same kind of thing. We were doing that on calculators. And, yep. you know, it started off like, you know, a math class. Our teacher would say like, oh, you know, you couldn't like eventually there was a way to like download from the Internet. You could download programs <laughs> yeah. and run them. Um, but if you could like program something yourself, like you could use it for like geometry to compute the hypotenuse of a triangle. Yep. Right. So we like code in simple, simple formulas into our into our calculators. And then eventually, yeah, like 
I wrote like both of us turned out we wrote like a little RPG, yep. you know. So I like a little turn-based fighting game where you were it was generating random numbers and deciding if you would hit the guy or not, and you just like really simple things. But you know, it's, you you learned a lot. Yeah, totally. I mean, the other thing is we had this awesome arms race in our math class. So for example, uh, we started writing programs to, to solve a lot of the geometry problems. And then the teacher, she caught on to it, and she was cool with us th- writing the pro- programs. The problem is that they were getting into the hands of like all the students in the class, and some students like were just using the program. They didn't really know what was going on. They were just putting in the answer. So she decided that she's gonna like make you wipe your, your calculator, but I didn't want my calculator to get wiped because I had all these games on it that I was working on, right? So I wrote a program that looked like the wipe your calculator screen but when you hit it it didn't do anything and then like and then you know when you're in like middle school or high school you want to be cool so you, so I started showing it off and then other people started writing it so then we all had the program then the teacher found out about the program and so then we, did it, we ended up with this arms race of like could you keep your stuff on the calculator Aww. That's horrible. Yeah, we, we didn't have that, but we, we did have people who would like learned you, like she would allow, the teacher would allow, maybe it's a he, I don't remember now, would allow um, programs, mm-hmm. but they wouldn't actually write programs. They didn't know how or didn't care to learn. And I wasn't about to get in big trouble or lose my ability to use it, so I wasn't going to share. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm meaner than you or something. Man, so you ran like a, a geometry program mafia or something. No, 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 no. I just wouldn't. Premium. I just wouldn't share it at all because I wanted to be able to use it. Oh, I you didn't have the grade. circle of trust? No. Like the circle is just you? Yes. There's a point? <laughs> I was the earliest Google Plus with only me in the circle. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, but people would just, instead of writing a program, they would just write, like, a cheat sheet in the in the code, right? So the code could never run. It wouldn't work. <laughs> but it would just, like, write out all the formulas and equations and everything. Yeah, the teacher in Spanish class is like, wow, these kids are using math to solve Spanish. <laughs> oh. Oh, man, that's pretty funny. So uh, this hasn't been an especially serious uh, version of Programming Throwdown, but it's a trip down. We had some heavy episodes, and we had Go, which is like heavy systems programming, like, you know, coroutines, all this stuff. And and we had Java, which is like so much stuff in Java. So we want to keep it light this time. Yeah, have some fun stuff every once in a while. Yeah. There are a lot of programming languages out there, so we got to cover the fun ones sometime, too. Yeah, totally, totally. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for kind comments and emails and Google Plus replies. And um, we went through a little bit of changing with the servers, which was uh, fun for Jason. Yeah, uh, I thought I could host programming third out of my house. That no, so thank you all work. for DDoSing Jason's house. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, first of all, uh, we have a lot of fans, way more than we thought, which is totally awesome. Uh, I'm going to start seeing if I can collect some metrics to find out exactly how many fans we, we will have. We will find you. Like that. Just kidding. Just kidding. And their houses. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and their address. No, but uh, we have tons of fans. We love you guys. It's awesome. Uh, way more fans than we thought. And, uh, yeah, you guys totally DDoSed my house to the point where I couldn't even check my own email. Oh, sad. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we're back on uh, we're back on reliable hosting, though. So this episode, uh, you should be able to download it at full bandwidth. Yeah, so apologize for any inconveniences anybody had with that. But we are back on track. Totally, totally. All right, until next time. See you guys later. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.